The War Between the Sexes, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 11. Biological Considerations so far as I can make out by experiments on laboratory animals, and by such discreet vivisections as are possible under our laws, there is no biological necessity for the superior acumen and circumspection of women. That is to say, it does not lie in any anatomical or physiological advantage. The essential feminine machine is no better than the essential masculine machine. Both are monuments to the maladroitness of a much overpraised creator. Women, it would seem, actually have smaller brains than men, though perhaps not in proportion to weight. Their nervous responses, if anything, are a bit duller than those of men. Their muscular coordinations are surely no prompter. One finds quite as many obvious botches among them. They have as many body blemishes. They are infested by the same microscopic parasites. Their senses are as obtuse. Their airs stand out as absurdly. Even assuming that their special malaises are wholly offset by the effects of alcoholism in the male, they suffer patently from the same adenoids, gastritis, cholelithiasis, nephritis, tuberculosis, carcinoma, arthritis, and so on. In short, from the same disturbances of colloidal equilibrium that produce religion, delusions of grandeur, democracy, pyemia, night sweats, the yearning to save humanity, and all other distempers in men. They have at bottom the same weaknesses and appetites. They react in substantially the same way to all chemical and mechanical agents. A dose of hydrocyanic acid, administered per aura to the most sagacious woman imaginable, affects her just as swiftly and just as deleteriously as affects a tragedian, a crossing sweeper, or an ambassador to the court of St. James. And once a bottle of coat rot or Schalkberger is in her, even the least emotional woman shows the same complex of sentimentalities that a man shows and is as maudlin and idiotic as he is. Nay, the superior acumen and self-possession of women is not inherent in any peculiarity of their constitutions, and above all, not in any advantage of a purely physical character. Its springs are rather to be sought in a physical disadvantage, that is, in the mechanical inferiority of their frames, their relative lack of tractive capacity, their deficiency as brute engines. That deficiency, as every one knows, is part a direct heritage from those females of the Pongo Pygmius who were their probable forerunners in the world. The same thing is to be observed in the females of almost all other species of mammals. But it is also partly due to the effects of use under civilization, and, above all, to what evolutionists call sexual selection. In other words, women were already measurably weaker than men at the dawn of human history and that relative weakness has been progressively augmented in the interval by the conditions of human life. For one thing, the process of bringing forth youth has been so much more exhausting as refinement has replaced savage sturdiness and callousness, and the care of them in infancy has become so much more onerous as the growth of cultural complexity has made education more intricate, that the two functions now lay vastly heavier burdens upon the strength and attention of a woman than they lay upon the strength and attention of any other female. And for another thing, the consequent disability and need of physical protection, by feeding and inflaming the already large vanity of man, have caused him to attach a concept of attractiveness to female weakness, so that he has come to esteem his woman, not in proportion as she is self-sufficient as a social animal, but in proportion as she is dependent. In this vicious circle of influences, women have been caught, and as a result their chief physical character today is their fragility. A woman cannot lift as much as a man, she cannot walk as far, she cannot exert as much mechanical energy in any other way. Even her alleged superior endurance, as Havelock Ellis has demonstrated in, quote, man and woman, end quote, is almost wholly mythical. She cannot, in point of fact, stand nearly so much hardship as a man can stand, and so the law usually an ass, exhibits an unaccustomed accuracy of observation in its assumption that, whenever husband and wife are exposed alike to fatal suffering, say in a shipwreck, the wife dies first. So far we have been among platitudes. There is less of overt platitude in the doctrine that it is precisely this physical frailty, 
that has given women their peculiar nimbleness and effectiveness on the intellectual side. Nevertheless, it is equally true. What they have done is what every healthy and elastic organism does in like case. They have sought compensation for their impotence in one field by employing their resources in another field to the utmost. And out of that constant and maximum use has come a marked enlargement of those resources. On the one hand, the sum of them present in a given woman has been enormously increased by natural selection, so that every woman, so to speak, inherits a certain extra-masculine mental dexterity as a mere function of her femaleness. And on the other hand, every woman, over and above this almost unescapable legacy from her actual grandmothers, also inherits admission to that traditional wisdom which constitutes the esoteric philosophy of woman as a whole. The virgin at adolescence is thus in the position of an unusually fortunate apprentice, for she is not only naturally gifted, but also apprenticed to extraordinarily competent masters, while a boy at the same period is learning from his elders little more than a few empty technical tricks, a few paltry vices, and a few degrading enthusiasms. His sister is under instruction in all those higher exercises of the wits that her special deficiencies make necessary to her security, and in particular in all those exercises which aim at overcoming the physical, and hence social and economic superiority of man by attacks upon his inferior capacity for clear reasoning, uncorrupted by illusion and sentimentality. 12. Honor here, it is obvious, the process of intellectual development takes color from the Sklaven moro, and is, in a sense, a product of it. The Jews, as Nietzsche has demonstrated, got their unusual intelligence by the same process. A contrary process is working in the case of the English and the Americans, and has begun to show itself in the case of the French and Germans. The sum of feminine wisdom that I have just mentioned, the body of feminine devices and competencies that is handed down from generation to generation of women, is, in fact, made up very largely of doctrines and expedients that infallibly appear to the average sentimental man, helpless as he is before them, as cynical and immoral. He commonly puts this aversion into the theory that women have no sense of honor. The criticism, of course, is characteristically banal. Honor is a concept too tangled to be analyzed here, but it may be sufficient to point out that it is predicated upon a feeling of absolute security, and that, in the capital conflict between man and woman out of which rises most of man's complaint of its absence, to wit, the conflict culminating in marriage already described, the security of the woman is not something that is an actual being, but something that she is striving with all arms to attain. In such a conflict it must be manifest that honor can have no place. An animal fighting for its very existence uses all possible means for offense and defense, however foul. Even man, for all his boasting about honor, seldom displays it when he is anything of the first value at hazard. He is honorable, perhaps, in gambling, for gambling is a mere vice. But it is quite unusual for him to be honorable in business, for business is bread and butter. He is honorable, so long as the stake is trivial, in his sports, but he seldom permits honor to interfere with his perjuries in a lawsuit, or with hitting below the belt in any other sort of combat that is in earnest. The history of all his wars is a history of mutual allegations of dishonorable practices, and such allegations are nearly always well grounded. The best imitation of honor that he ever actually achieves in them is a highly self-conscious sentimentality which prompts him to be humane to the opponent who has been wounded, or disarmed, or otherwise made innocuous. Even here his so-called honor is little more than a form of play-acting, both maudlin and dishonest. In the actual death struggle, he invariably bites. Perhaps one of the chief charms of woman lies precisely in the fact that they are dishonorable, that is, that they are relatively uncivilized. In the midst of all the puerile repressions and inhibitions that hedge them round, they continue to show a gypsy spirit. No genuine woman ever gives a hoot for law if law happens to stand in the way of her private interest. She is essentially an outlaw, a rebel what H. G. Wells calls a nomad. The boons of civilization are so noisily cried up by sentimentalists that we are all apt to overlook its disadvantages. Intrinsically, it is a mere device for regimenting men. It is a perfect symbol in the goose-step. 
the most civilized man is simply that man who has been most successful in caging and harnessing his honest and natural instinct. That is, the man who has done the most cruel violence to his own ego in the interest of the commonweal. The value of this commonweal is always overestimated. What is it at bottom? Simply the greatest good to the greatest number of petty rogues, ignoramuses, and poltroons. The capacity for submitting to and prospering comfortably under this cheesemonger civilization is far more marked in men than in women, and far more in inferior men than in men of the higher categories. It must be obvious to even so pathetic an ass as a university professor of history that very few of the genuinely first-rate men of the race have been wholly civilized, in the sense that the term is employed in newspapers and in the pulpit. Think of Caesar, Bonaparte, Luther. Frederick the Great, Cromwell, Barbarossa, Innocent the Third, Bolivar, Hannibal, Alexander, and to come down to our own time, Grant, Stonewall Jackson, Bismarck, Wagner, Garibaldi, and Cecil Rhodes. 13. Women and the Emotions The fact that women have a greater capacity than men for controlling and conceal their emotions is not an indication that they are more civilized but a proof that they are less civilized. This capacity, so rare today and withal so valuable and worthy of respect, is a characteristic of savages, not of civilized men, and its loss is one of the penalties that the race has paid for the tawdry boon of civilization. Your true savage, reserved, dignified, and courteous, knows how to mask his feelings even in the face of the most desperate assault upon them. Your civilized man is forever yielding to them. Civilization, in fact, grows more and more maudlin and hysterical, especially under democracy it tends to degenerate into a mere combat of crazes. The whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed, and hence clamorous to be led to safety, by an endless series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. Wars are no longer waged by the will of superior men, capable of judging dispassionately and intelligently the causes behind them and the effects flowing out of them. They are now begun by first throwing a mob into a panic. They are ended only when it has spent its ferine fury. Here the effect of civilization has been to reduce the noblest of the arts, once the repository of an exalted etiquette and the chosen avocation of the very best men of the race, to the level of a ride of peasants. All the wars of Christendom are now disgusting and degrading. Their conduct of them is passed out of the hands of nobles and knights, and into the hands of mob raiders money-lenders, and atrocity-mongers. To recreate oneself with war in the grand manner, as Prince Eugene Marlborough and the old Dessauer knew it, one must now go among barbarian peoples. Women are nearly always against war in modern times, for the reason brought forward to justify it are usually either transparently dishonest or childishly sentimental, and hence provoke their scorn. But once the business has begun, they commonly favor its conduct à outrance, and are thus in accord with the theory of the great captains of more spacious days. In Germany, during the late war, the protest against the Schleichenkeit, practiced by the Imperial Army and Navy, did not come from women, but from sentimental men. In England and the United States there is no record that any woman ever raised her voice against the blockade which destroyed hundreds and thousands of German children. I was on both sides of the bloody chasm during the war, and I cannot recall meeting a single woman who subscribed to the puerile doctrine that, in so vast a combat between nations, there could still be categories of non-combatants, with a right of asylum on armed ships and in garrison towns. This imbecility was maintained only by men, large numbers of whom simultaneously took part in wholesale massacres of such non-combatants. The women were superior to such hypocrisy. They recognized the nature of modern war instantly and accurately, and advocated no disingenuous efforts to conceal it. 14. Pseudo-Anesthesia The feminine talent for concealing emotion is probably largely responsible for the common masculine belief that women are devoid of passion, and contemplate its manifestations in the male with something akin to trembling. Here the talent itself is helped out by the fact that very few masculine observers, on the occasions where they give attention to the matter, are in a state of mind conducive to exact observation. 
The truth is, of course, that there is absolutely no reason to believe that the normal woman is passionless, or that the minority of women who unquestionably are is of formidable dimensions. To be sure, the peculiar vanity of men, particularly in the northern countries, makes them place a high value upon the virginal type of woman, and so this type tends to grow more common by sexual selection, but despite that fact, it has by no means superseded the normal type, so realistically described by the theologians and publicists of the Middle Ages. It would, however, be rash to assert that this long-continued sexual selection has not made itself felt, even in the normal type. Its chief effect, perhaps, is to make it measurably easier for a woman to conquer and conceal emotion than it is for a man. But this is a mere reinforcement of a native quality, or at all events, a quality long antedating the rise of the curious preference just mentioned. That preference obviously owes its origin to the concept of private property, and is most evident in those countries in which the largest proportion of males are property owners. That is, in which the property-owning caste reaches down into the lowest conceivable strata of bounders and ignoramuses. The low caste man is never quite sure of his wife, unless he is convinced that she is entirely devoid of amorous susceptibility. Thus he grows uneasy whenever she shows any sign of responding in kind to his own elephantine emotions, and is apt to be suspicious of even so trivial a thing as a hearty response to a connubial kiss. If he could manage to rid himself of such suspicions, there would be less public gabble about anesthetic wives, and fewer books written by quacks with sure cures for them and a good deal less cold mutton formalism and boredom at the domestic hearth. I have a feeling that the husband of this sort, he is very common in the United States and almost uncommon among the middle classes of England, Germany, and Scandinavia, does himself a serious disservice and that he is uneasily conscious of it. Having got himself a wife to his austere taste, he finds that she is rather depressing that his vanity is almost as painfully damaged by her emotional inertness as it would have been by too provocative and hedonistic spirit. For one thing, that chiefly delights a man when some woman has gone through the solemn buffoonery of yielding to his great love, is the sharp and flattering contrast between her reserve in the presence of other men and her enchanting complaisance in the presence of himself. Here his vanity is enormously tickled. To the world in general she seems remote and unapproachable. To him she is docile, fluttering, gurgling, even a bit abandoned. It is as if some great magnifico male, some inordinate Tsar or Kaiser, should step down from the throne to play dominoes with him behind the door. The greater the contrast between the lady's two fronts, the greater his satisfaction. Up to, of course, the point where his suspicions are aroused. Let her diminish that contrast ever so little on the public side, by smiling at a handsome actor by saying a word too many to an attentive head-waiter, by holding the hand of the rector of the parish, by winking amiably at his brother or at her sister's husband. And at once the poor fellow begins to look for clandestine notes, to employ private inquiry agents, and to scrutinize the eyes, ears, noses, and hair of his children with shameful doubts. This explains many domestic catastrophes. 15. Mythical Anthropophagi the man-hating woman, like the cold woman, is largely imaginary. One often encounters references to her in literature, but who has ever met her in real life? As for me, I doubt that such a monster has ever actually existed. There are, of course, women who spend a great deal of time denouncing and reviling men, but these are certainly not genuine man-haters. They are simply women who have done their utmost to snare men, and failed. Of such sort are the majority of the inflammatory suffragettes of the sex hygiene and birth control species. The rigid limitation of offspring, in fact, is chiefly advocated by women who run no more risk of having unwilling motherhood forced upon them than so many mummies of the Tenth Dynasty. All their unhealthy interest in such noisome matters has behind it merely a subconscious yearning to attract the attention of men, who are supposed to be partial to the enterprises that are difficult or forbidden. But certainly the enterprise of dissuading such a propagandist from her gospel would not be difficult, and I know of no law forbidding it. I'll begin to believe in the man-hater the day I am introduced to a woman who has definitely and finally refused a chance of marriage to a man who is of her own station in life, able to support her, unafflicted by any loathsome disease, and of recently decent aspect and manners, 
in brief, a man who is thoroughly eligible. I doubt that any such woman breathes the air of Christendom. Whenever one comes to confidential terms with an unmarried woman, of course, she favors one with a long chronicle of the men she has refused to marry, greatly to their grief. But unsentimental cross-examination, at least in my experience, always develops the fact that every one of these men suffered from some obvious and intolerable disqualification. Either he had a wife already, and was vague about his ability to get rid of her, or he was drunk when he was brought to his proposal and repudiated it and forgot it the next day, or he was bankrupt, or he was old and decrepit, or he was young and plainly idiotic, or he had diabetes or a bad heart, or his relatives were impossible, or he believed in spiritualism or democracy or the Baconian theory or some other such nonsense. Restricting the thing to men palpably eligible, I believe thoroughly that no sane woman has ever actually muffed the chance. Now and then, perhaps, a miraculously fortunate girl has two victims on the mat simultaneously and has to lose one. But they are seldom, if ever, both good chances. One is nearly always a duffer, thrown in in the telling to make the bourgeoisie marvel. 16. A Conspiracy of Silence the reason why all this has to be stated here is simply that women, who could not state it much better, have almost unanimously refrained from discussing such matters at all. One finds, indeed, a sort of general conspiracy, infinitely alert and jealous against the publication of esoteric wisdom of the sex, and even against the acknowledgment that any such body of erudition exists at all. Men, having more vanity and less discretion, are a good deal less cautious. There is, in fact, a whole literature of masculine babbling, ranging from Machiavelli's appalling confession of political theory to the egoistic confidences of such men as Nietzsche, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Casanova, Max Stirner, Benvito Cellini, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Lord Chesterfield. But it is very rarely that a Marie Bashkirtsev or Margaret Asquith lets down the veils which conceal the acromatic doctrine of the other sex. It is transmitted from mother to daughter, so to speak, behind the door. One observes its practical workings, but hears little about its principles. The causes of this secrecy are obvious. Women, in the last analysis, can prevail against men in the great struggle for power and security only by keeping them disarmed, and, in the main, unwarned. In a pitched battle, with devil taking the hindmost, their physical and economic inferiority would inevitably bring them to disaster. Thus they have to apply their peculiar talents warily and with due regard to the danger of arousing the foe. He must be attacked without any formal challenge, and even without any suspicion of challenge. This strategy lies at the heart of what Nietzsche calls the slave morality, in brief, a morality based upon a concealment of egoistic purpose, a code of ethics having for its foremost character a bold denial of its actual aim. End of the war between the sexes.